Welcome to the party. It is a party, and it is a Tuesday morning if you're listening in real time. And I love you, man. Short-term rental management. This is a good time all the time. Today, we've got a guest. I've got a guest today. Branching out from being by myself and preaching it. Uh, we got a gentleman named Stephen Petaskey. He's done a pivot, uh, and he's uh, starting a new property management company based on a whole lot of prior experience in the business. And I think you're going to dig his story and might have some information to help you out on your journey as well. And, hey, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I do want everybody to know we sell vacation houses. We have a team of real estate agents, number one team worldwide, three years in a row at EXP, over $3 billion in real estate sold. And that is called the Short Term Shop. And of course, my wife is in charge over there, Avery. And we would love to help you on the purchase of your next vacation home. And of course, you come hang out with me and I'll teach you how to, how to rent it out. Because I'm the world's greatest landlord. Loudmouth Luke, short term rental management. If you like what you're hearing, if you're picking up what I'm putting down, you can join me on a live weekly call to talk about your next short term rental or ask questions about the one you already have. I am live once per week on Zoom. I would love to have you come and say hello. It's strquestions.com. That's strquestions.com. Come and join us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Short-term rental management. Uh, all the all things vacation rentals and property management and landlording and becoming a better, uh, better landlord and getting higher gross income and all of the fun stuff. And today I've got uh, Steve Petaskey, who's got a fantastic backstory. He's been in the business a long time. And uh, I'd like for you to start there, if you don't mind, Steve, go back to the early days and... Uh, kind of walk us through your whole journey in this business. Yeah, for sure. Look, thanks for having me on the show, by the way. I appreciate it and I uh, appreciate uh, promoting short-term rentals. It's, uh, it's a great business to be in. So yeah, uh, 18 years ago, my wife and I, she was pregnant with uh, our first child. We have a boy and a girl. And I remember thinking back then, a bunch of our friends were like, oh man, the travel's going to suck for you guys once you have a baby. You know, they it's, it's so hard and take them out of the airplane sucks and, you know, nothing really works. And we, my wife and I love travel. It's kind of what brought us together. And we just, just couldn't um, believe that travel was going to become a, a worse thing for us. We couldn't imagine it outside of our lives. So we thought, well, what, what do we need? What would we want to travel? I we went through the three options. You know, one is you go to a hotel, um, which obviously gives you the the certainty and as a new family, you know, certainty is very helpful to know what you're going to get. But, uh, you know, hotel room is, uh, is no fun, especially, you know, it takes the romance to have a baby in a crib, you know, beside your bed in a 400 square foot hotel room. So that kind of killed that. Then there's vacation rentals. This is like, you know, pre Airbnb days, but you have Verbo. And this is, uh, you know, a time when things were horribly inconsistent, you know, in 2006, you know, in terms of you never really knew if the pictures you saw matched up with the experience. And again, as a new family, absent of having that um, that consistency we just we just couldn't do that either the third option is buy your own home you know you get you get to you know set up exactly how you want have all your things there but we wanted variety and we had no money so buying our own home really wasn't an option but it was something we could uh, we could think about we thought wouldn't it be amazing if we had 30 properties that we owned ourselves and we could set them up exactly the way we want like play pens and booster seats and baby monitors and great linens and great kitchens i love to cook um, and then we know exactly what we're going to get and we have equity and that equity can grow. And we thought, great, this sounds awesome. We just need $30 million. How do, how do we do that? Um, so we actually started a fund and we went to 18 friends and family. Uh, everyone put in a couple hundred grand each. That was pretty much all we had. And we bought, raised three and a half million bucks, bought three homes, placed in Maui, uh, ski summer property in Western Canada, and then a, a place in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, um, that became kind of our fractional approach to vacation homes. We acquired them. Bought them all with cash, set them up exactly the way we wanted, and the 18 partners were able to share those homes. We all got a couple of months a year to kind of spread between the various assets, beach, golf, you know, ski summer. And uh, it was really cool. We didn't know really where it would grow, but it kind of got some traction, and we ended up building a team. We ended up raising $100 million over the next seven years and bought 50 properties, you know, mostly Western U.S., Latin America, Caribbean, Tuscany, and grew the thing pretty big, and it was a lot of fun. Had a whole concierge team, asset management team, and provide about 20,000 vacation experiences for these 400 investors. And uh, it was an awesome run and uh, kind of brought us to where we are today, which is um, as of three weeks ago, we had our last vacation in that version called 1.0 of Luxus. And by the way, Luxus is the Latin word for luxury. So it's like luxury vacation properties. And uh, we decided to do a pivot when COVID hit. 
really hit us hard in Canada. In particular, they had everything locked down and we gave us a chance to pause and we decided to exit the call it the fractional or co-ownership space and we're moving into the vacation rental space. Um, we're good. We have a great team, have all the right people to run it. And now it just kind of comes down to saying maybe we can apply this brand standard more globally. And I'll, obviously we'll talk about that today because I'm pretty passionate about it. But we're into the uh, version 2.0 after 18 years of, uh, of the first one. Fantastic. So back up to the first version. This is fascinating stuff. This was uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, yeah. So I guess first explain to me what your role was in that. Were you the management? We were the management. So basically we set up a structure like a, a general partner, limited partner structure. And um, so we were the general partner there by the manager of all the properties. And then there was an unlimited amount of limited partners. We had three separate funds of about 30 to $35 million each raising money, hundred to 200 grand at a time. Like one family would take a piece of that fund and they, based on how much equity they put in, would give how much time they would have allocated towards that, that property portfolio. And so my job was really, I mean, when we first started it, it was like, you had no office and we're totally different careers and it's all coffee shop meetings, but we struck a chord with these initial 18 people that said, geez, that's what I'm missing in my life. I don't want a whole property right now. I want a part of a property. I want a trusted manager. I want it set up the way that I want it set up. So I know when I get down there, it's got all the things that I can be comfortable and what I, uh, you know, my expectations are met. So the snowball effect happened. I mean, there's about 50 people in the industry at the time in 06, uh, early 07. Um, we were the smallest. We were 50 out of 50. And then we actually grew to become the largest in North America within this, uh, you know, relatively small industry in terms of an equity based uh, model like this. Um, because a whole bunch of other companies were loading up with debt. And they got crushed during the Great Recession. And we were buying with cash, so we did very well. And um, we had a we had a good run. And we had, had a team and hired some you know, hotel folks and helped us build this whole, you know, concierge service experience and management uh, component to make sure that uh, our partners got what they expected. And uh, it was it was a lot of fun. What year was this, give or take? Like the, the very beginning. Very so late late oh six so yeah our son was born in February uh, twenty um, two thousand seven and we literally launched that month you know so it was all came out of this situation of like second trimester we were trying to plan our travel when our we had a baby in this world and so early oh seven was the the kickoff and founding of the Luxus Group okay and uh, was it like it sounds a bit like a timeshare uh, were, were these people getting a return. Yeah, so this is where people get the, the it, you know, because we are sharing ownership. But the difference with a timeshare is you own deeded time. This is actually you are a partner. So think of it just like a syndicate. You want to buy a multifamily, and you put ten people in the syndicate, and you spend five million bucks. The difference is, is that in your situation, you probably won't want to live in the multifamily. Yeah. In our case, is that there was all just a syndicate, the same way you'd structure any type of investment syndicate of ownership. The difference is instead of renting it out for a return. The return was the usage of the assets by the partners. So that was the differentiating factor versus a timeshare. You don't really own anything. That's why you know there's 50% commissions. And that's why they generally go down. But the concept is similar, sharing ownership of an asset. It's just that you get a chance to use the asset, which was the fun part. But they were getting an actual return on the rents as well or just the, uh, using the properties? No, that's that's the difference. So there's no, there was no um, uh, rents. Uh, except that all of 100% of the operating costs were divvied up proportionally amongst the partners. So everyone, so the, the funding of the day-to-day -day management, um, the property utilities, the concierge, all those aspects were split up amongst the syndicate. So again, maybe the easier way to look at it is you, me, and three buddies put 200 grand each and buy a million dollar home and it costs 100 grand a year to run that home. We all got a $20,000 bill to use that home. So that's the most, like the true baseline of it is thinking of four buddies or five buddies buying a home together. We don't rent it out. We purely pay into that home to keep the operating costs. This is just scaled to $100 million in 50 homes. And so, so you didn't rent them out at all? No, it oh. was purely like a private club for vacation homes. And so and, when, uh, when you exited, I would assume you made uh, quite a big chunk there on the sale of the properties. Yeah, so that was the good side of it is obviously when you, you know, it was more of a capital preservation appreciation play. And then you get your, the good thing is there's kind of two points of the return, like how much the capital could appreciate during that life cycle, like roughly 10 year cycle of the assets of growth. But then the operating costs to be in the group were a lot less to rent a comparable property. It was about 25%. So if I, it cost me roughly, if you were to average it out $250 a night in the early stages to rent, to use the homes but it would rent out for a thousand bucks a night. So you kind of get, 
as a home, as an investor, you get the Delta, you know, instead of renting that, that Maui condo for a thousand bucks a night, your operating costs were only 250 to 300 bucks a night. So that's kind of like the return was a combined. When you combine the two together, like I have one partner, for example, for 13 years, he got a million dollars of value on his $150,000 investment because he traveled all the time and used all of his time up. And then the asset appreciation was pretty good. Uh, you know, one of the funds obviously you know grew in value. The thing is we're constantly reinvesting capital back in the homes to keep that really very, very high standard for the investors. Um, so it wasn't the, the capital side wasn't some big, you know, massive home run, but when you combine it with the usage side and the value they received on that, it was, uh, it was a great return for all. How did you pick the, uh, the homes? Uh, these were in r- r- exotic locations. It was, uh, like, was there a collaborative uh, effort there or was that your job? It's a great question. It was my job, but we definitely took a collaborative approach. So we would always poll our investors and say, Hey, we now have, Hawaii, Southern California, you know, we kind of have the basics down. Where else do you want to go? And I'd be like, you know, I really wouldn't. I'd like to be Costa Rica, you know, or, or um, you know, Caribbean. So then our job was to go out and find destinations and homes that ultimately would suit what we believed our partner's profile wanted. So the for more exotic we went, we went to like, you know, get Costa Rica, Caribbean, uh, Tuscany, the more, I would say, safe and selective we had to be on the assets. Because our partners maybe are used to going to Hawaii and it's comfortable and you know what you're going to get or Florida. Um, you go to Costa Rica, it's a little bit more, I don't know, scary, a little more exotic. So we would pick in gated communities um, that have you know, significant amenities. And, and, and it was just a, it was a lot of fun shopping over those years. You know, we didn't, uh, uh, as you know, we'll go in, you get a chance to buy with cash. Obviously, the market was pretty low, so we had lots of options. And um, But you really want to get it right. And we didn't get it right all the time, but I think we did pretty pretty good job all over to create experiences that our partners wanted to have uh, in these really you know special destinations. Then our team took care of everything for them. So they go to Costa Rica, we'd have the driver lined up or deliver their rental car to the house and a private mm-hmm. chef. And so we'd have this really you know, high level curated service component um, so that when they got there, they weren't just like guessing, you know, in terms of what to do. So we were pretty proud of uh, how that all shook out. Are these uh these these are starting to sound like like uber wealthy people? These are uh, cream of the crop people here. Well, you know what's it, that's an easy, it's a good point. Is and the answer is no. So our average home value would have been probably if you blended everything together between kind of one to five million. But oh. what it actually did is so they weren't like these ultra luxury homes. You divide that on five to six people per home. It's only you know two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar investment on, on an average. We had one fund that was a little more luxury, and the other ones were kind of one to two million. So it was actually more like aspirational luxury. A lot of our, our partners, some of them absolutely were uber wealthy, and this would be like their their fourth home, you know, option. But it actually opened the door for a lot of people to stay at a home that they probably wouldn't rent themselves or couldn't afford to rent, um, or be a stress for them. And they got access to this really special experience because they only had a one sixth ownership of every asset. So it opened the door instead of being maybe the top one percent income earners, it opened the door for the top ten percent income earners to access this portfolio of homes because it was a fractional approach. So that was pretty cool because, um, it, it, you know, for all of us, and my, my wife and I included, we're a great example. We didn't have that type of money to spend a $4 million house, but now in a syndicated format, we did. And we had some of the best vacations. We had the best vacations of our life as a result of that. And memories that it would have cost us three, $4,000 a night to rent. And uh, that was way out of our price range. So this kind of opened the door for people in that top 10% bracket to travel like the top 1% or 05 or 1%. Is it a little bit like flex jet for lack of a better, I, again, I don't know how to compare this to anything, but it's almost like a. Yeah. Net jets. Net jets would be a great jet. example. Yeah. Net jets. So it's a perfect example that this is, is this, I'm glad you asked that. This was very much pioneered by the private aviation industry. This type of fractional piece where people don't want to own a whole jet. So mm-hmm. you buy a one eighth or one sixteenth of a jet. But you get access to that that portion. You pay your operating costs, and every time it goes in the air, you pay when you're flying. So the the industry is very healthy on the fractional jet program, um, and so very much uh, certainly fractional ownerships existed for a long time. But in a syndicate of homes or a syndic like a fleet of aircraft, private aviation has been uh, very much a pioneer of this uh, this aspect. And um, but I'll be honest, it's it's a hard industry. There's not a lot of us in the world. Um, it's I think this is a great thing for your listeners. It's a I think there's a huge opportunity, but you really have to have a really strong friends and family group out of the gate. We're exiting it because we have an aspirations to get to hundreds of luxury vacation homes and raising capital at that scale is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, it's challenging. 
But if you wanted to build a portfolio of five or 10 or 15 homes, anyone can do this. Go round up 10 or 15 friends by two or three homes. And then you, you, you become the manager and, um, and you can start to build your own portfolio of own vacation homes. You make a management fee on the, you know, that you charge your group. You never lose money. You never make a ton of money because you have this consistent management fee coming through. And how we structured it was a, we got a, a piece of the appreciation at the end. So if there's a viewer or a listener on here that says, hey, this is pretty interesting. You know, I'm going to raise three million bucks by three one million dollar homes. And those homes are worth you know, six million, let's say, in 10 years from now. You know, generally, 25 percent of the appreciation goes to the manager and 75 percent goes to the partners. So there is a chance to have a windfall at the end of this kind of seven to 10 year run, whatever life cycle you put on it. And uh, even though we're exiting the business, I'm a huge fan of it. It just comes down to the scale that we're trying to grow now um, doesn't um, isn't congruent with uh, you know, raising capital at that scale. So you still own a few of those houses now? Or they're all we're gone. literally in the final stages of selling them off. So we've already sold about sixty million worth, and we're in the last, I don't know, probably twenty million worth of real estate, and that'll probably all be sold up in the last six months. Then we'll be officially, officially out of that side of the business. And this, so this, you've had these homes for a long time. Yeah, we have. Yeah, and we have. Yeah, some happy. of them were like. Did anybody oh. exit the situation? Uh, so the cool thing of how we structured, I'd recommend someone else to do it. So other groups tried to do it with no fixed exit date. We did 10-year cycles. There's this automatic 10-year trigger that we have to create a disposition event to exit people um, at that time. So everyone bought in with the mindset, I'm in this for 10 years. Now, there's always things that happen within the 10 years, sadly, death or divorce or you know something that happens financially. And so we had a process in which they could sell to a private buyer if there was demand for that. But generally speaking, you, you buy in for the 10 years, you're in for the 10 years. And then we have this liquidation event, which we're going through now on our last two funds and everyone gets their proportionate share of equity as we sell the assets. I see, yeah. I see. This episode of The Short Term Show is brought to you by The Short Term Shop. If you're interested in buying a short-term rental in one of the top vacation markets in America, just go to theshorttermshop.com and click get connected with an agent. If you purchase a home with the shop, you'll have access to all of our client only benefits, such as training on how to manage your short-term rental. So we'll teach you everything you need to know from how to set up your Airbnb and Burbo listings to how to use the property management software that you'll need to streamline your business, all the way down to helping you source your local boots on the ground like cleaners, handy people, etc. We've taught thousands of people just like you how to buy and manage their vacation homes from anywhere in the world. So head on over to theshorttermshop.com and click get connected with an agent to get started. I do have to mention that we're brokered by eXp or else I get in trouble. We'll see you guys over there. Would you do this again? I am personally for, I, I would, I'm mentoring a couple groups on this right now for them to launch. For me personally, no, because where I'm at my, in our business cycle, I mentioned briefly in the pre-call, but we've got, we're working with Four Seasons and Marion on some ground up development opportunities. We have a development division as well. And we're really inspired by this, you know, hotelier pro vacation homes. And we'll talk about that maybe next. But when it comes to this, we're out of it because we didn't want a distraction from this next 10 year growth cycle. We're going to try to build this hopefully very significant business. Um, and But I'm a massive believer in what we were doing. It's just that yeah. if we had a bunch of these funds and syndicates competing with this other op product offering, we just felt we wanted to go all in on one thing. But there wasn't like a lot of money to be made here, right? It's, or, or was there on the exit of the property? Uh, or was it just mostly just kind of for, for vacation purposes? Well, it's, yeah. So no, for an individual investor, um, if we think there's two things, the, the managing partner, the person starting it and the individual investor, the individual investor is the, where they get their value is, you know, two things. I'm parking 200 grand and I think it's going to be worth 250 or 300. I'm not looking for like a th three banger or this is going to go way up. There's, this is about like capital preservation and appreciation. The advantage for them is again, to rent those homes versus the cost of operating those homes is substantially higher. So if let's say their travel budget was $20,000 a year, you know, and they, they would get 20 nights for that. So a thousand bucks a night, the same 20 nights in Luxus, for example, cost you about five to $6,000. So it's like, oh geez, instead of spending 20 grand a year, I'm spending six or 7,000. That's a true cost of operating those homes as a partner. I'm saving $14,000. So I just had another $14,000 return on my $200,000 investment. I got another 7% return on that investment. So that's uh, so this is less about making money. It's a lifestyle investment, capital preservation, appreciation. I'm saving money on my, my travel. If you don't travel, 
this you'd never invest in this. But if you travel a lot, it does actually um, pencil up very nicely from that perspective. For the managing partner perspective, how I would recommend people to do it, we didn't do it perfectly, but you basically have a fee structure where you get a little bit up front when you raise capital. So you're out when you, with your hustle and building all the marketing documents, you make a bit of money there. Um, the industry average is 20%. We were a lot less. We were like seven and a half to 10% on the initial capital raise. And then you charge a management fee for running it. So like a cost plus or some fixed management fee. So you're, you're making money every year. It doesn't add up to much until you get to some level of scale, like 10 properties, but you make something. And then at the end of the day, hopefully these properties, you've chosen the assets well and they appreciate and you get a, you get a slice of that. So the person who's kicking it off, there's kind of three sources of revenue, um, you know, two that can be certain and one that is based on whatever it grows to financially, which is good, though, because you want, you know, you want accountability as the managing partner. You're selecting good assets. You're buying them well because you're, 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 you're a steward of that person's capital. And you want to make sure you're trying to pick the best assets that have the best chance for a great experience, but also for great appreciation. So for a guy doing a one, you know, when I was a one person shop, we grew to a 10 person shop, um, you can make some money and it's a, it's a lot of fun. And the investors have a great, great experience and they make some money too. And then if you want to do, a, you know, half, you know, to a hundred million dollar or billion dollar company, no one's been able to do in the world yet. <laughs> so I, I wasn't going to be the one, but can you grow to become a, a, an eight figure, nine figure uh, assets under management? Absolutely. And this, uh, this was a, your day to day was making sure that this place was killer, like ready to rock, had all the cool shit and all that kind exactly. of stuff. What, what, what did that look like? Yeah, that was the fun part. You know, I think, um, you know, we always, we got feedback as we went along how to make it better and better, but we just took the baseline of my family. So what are the things as a young family we need? So, you know, first set up play pads, booster seats, you know, for women, like hair grooming utensils, put like salon grade hair dryers in it. So you don't have to pack an extra suitcase of stuff because you don't know what's going to be there. And then you have pool toys and you have board games. You have, you know, back in the day, DVD set. Obviously, now it's different. And um, you'd have uh, all, all sorts of things, a fully stocked liquor cabinet, kind of in a pay it forward setup. So the partners would use some and restock with others. So you had a lot of these things that made it feel like when you walked in, aside from having your own suitcase of the physical clothes you need to wear, you didn't need to bring anything else. And that was the fun aspect of it. And it's a really fun culture that we built around that aspect with our partners. And uh, and they got a chance to enjoy the homes as if they were their own because they were their own just via syndicate versus via single ownership. So you can set up the homes that you want. Now, people, I know some companies put cars in the garage, um, boats in the marina. You know, there's various liabilities and things associated with that, additional costs. But you can make them as decked out as you want, depending upon the you know the size of uh, the, the home, the luxuriness of the home, I guess. Um, but it's totally up to uh, what the group wants. But for us, that was kind of we made it. So no matter where you went, you knew what you're going to get, and you had a crap ton of fun at the while you're staying there. All right, cool, cool. So then you are, you know, you're now transitioning. It sounds like into just full full on property management. So tell me about that. Yeah. So the the big um, I guess pivot for us came during COVID. So in the U.S., our peers within this industry thrived because the U.S. is such a you know you know they have everything. You ski properties when your kind of borders were shut. Um, people could still travel and do these. So our peers crushed it during COVID. We were the opposite in Canada. Things were completely locked down and our partners couldn't travel for like a year. So we stopped raising money and we just paused. And we it was really frustrating. You know, it's frustrating for us, frustrating for our partners. And we as a manager, me and my wife and uh, our team had to decide when this COVID thing stops and the borders open up, are we going to go back to this business we've done? Or is this the time that we can allow these events to happen, pay the money out and start something new? And I think what we aspired to, Luke, was we wanted to, we're really proud of the brand standard. Like we knew the joy that our partners got staying in their home and like the mental freedom they had when they were going to their homes that they knew what they were going to get versus the mental anguish when you book a home on Verbo or Airbnb and you really don't know what you're going to get till you get there. Some hosts are great, like phenomenal. And a lot of hosts are really crappy. And there's no way that Airbnb can fully control, you know, 6 million doors around the world. So in our case, we thought, let's let's bring this to the world. And the only way to bring it to the world is we have to get out of, out of ownership and we have to get into management. And then we have an infinite amount of scale. But in every single home, we apply this Luxus standard we spent 18 years developing. Same linen, same pillows, same towels, same hair dryers, same bath and body wash, same kitchen setup, same electronics. So when someone comes to Luxus now, and you can go to LuxusVP.com, we just did our soft launch a week ago. So this is you know very timely call. We're going to grow to 40, 30 to 40 properties in year one, and then it'll be growing at 50 to 100 properties a year from that point on. 
And think of going to, I don't know, Marriott in the sense that when you are booking, we have a rewards program for our most loyal guests or for all of our people traveling with us. And no matter where you go, Cabo, Hawaii, eventually Destin, <laughs> Florida, Tuscany, you're getting the same experience. And we want when someone books with Luxus, they know what they're going to get. And if we can help people have that that certainty, that's why people travel, if they get loyal to airlines, they know what they're going to get or they travel to hotels. It doesn't exist in our space at a, at a um, global level. And uh, that sounds you know like global like this big thing, but we want to get to four to 500 properties and, uh, and then allow us to pay a jumping point to something bigger. And then ideally, people travel with us and they don't need to travel anywhere else, you know, unless they're going cruising or exotic vacations. But we ideally have 30, 40 markets around the world. They can pick their adventure and um, we can we can guarantee certainty. And that's um, what others can't. So that's what we're really, really excited about. How does how does that work logistically uh, or even compare that this to any really nationwide property management company? Uh, do you have to have a, a real estate license in every state? Uh, like, how does that work? Yeah, so it's complicated. Every state's got its own rules, as you know. Right. So in uh, some states are highly regulated, like in our Western states would be like Arizona, Nevada, Hawaii, and then surprisingly, California is unregulated in the short-term rental space. Um, so every state's got its own thing. So we set up, it is very complicated. I've put a lot of money in to get this going, but you have to set up brokerages in each one of these states that were wholly owned by us. And then we have principal brokers or designated brokers in each state that work for us. Um, and they become effectively like a market leader. So they're ultimately responsible for the compliance um, uh, responsibilities for that particular market. And so very complicated, very hard to scale, which is why very few people have done it. We talked to the CASA, they have done it. And there are a few others that have, you know, multiple states. So very hard startup for it, which is why there's not a lot of global players in this space. And so that's logistics number one, the kind of the whole corporate structure and the flow. And then number two, from the homeowner perspective, the mechanics go something like this. Look, you got a home in the Smoky Mountains. You want Luxus to manage it. Um, you call us. Or somehow we solicit you, and we will try to earn your business. We give you you know, what we think the market comps are, where it could be. We then audit your house, and we say, your house is, is great. We love your furniture. It's the right size. Three bedrooms, four bedrooms, great location. We now need to add the Luxus brand standard. And for you, we need to add the linens and the towels and the various things, and that's going to be $15,000. So the biggest barrier in this particular situation is Luke saying, you know what, I don't want to spend 15 grand uh, up front for this in order to, you know, maybe do better than I'm doing now. Obviously, proof of performance. You could pull 100 people and 99 out of 100 would say they would pay, you know, 5% more or a few percent more. Or if it was all things being equal, even equal to the market of the comp, they would stay with something certain versus something uncertain. So our thesis is, is that we're going to get higher occupancies and slightly higher ADRs than the neighboring property when people coming through Luxus know what they're going to get on the other side. So we audit the home. Luke says, you know what? 15 grand's worth it. I've got a million dollar home. It's only 15 grand. And then obviously we take over full management and we just send you checks every month and it runs through our platforms and uh, we go rent it to our, you know, thousands of people that already follow us. And then obviously we still use the OTAs. So Luxus VP is the primary channel and then excess inventory goes in Airbnb and VRBO. Uh, and then hopefully what happens, someone comes through Airbnb, stays at your home, and they're like, holy shit, this is like an incredible, sorry if I swear, I can't remember if you allow swearing on the show, just a little <laughs> just a little swear word there. Um, and they're like, this was incredible. And on the TV, it shows the Luxus portfolio around the world, and that Joe Smith staying at your home says, I want to stay here again, and I'm going to book another Luxus home. And they get into our direct booking platform versus relying on Airbnb. So that would be the mechanics of onboarding home. We send a team down to set up your house. Everything's labeled, everything's dialed in, and it gets rolled into our portfolio. And then we're off to the races renting your home. There you go. Yeah. Uh, 15 grand is all, is, is that going to go up, you think? Or is that based on the size of the property? Or Combination of size and what you have. Like, for example, if you got really amazing towels, you know, that are at or above the standard we already have, we don't have to put in the lux of towels. But if you got pink towels and they're worn out, then we got to put on our, you know, our our towels. So every lot is different. Like some guys starting from true scratch. Like I bought an empty house, a four bedroom house in Phoenix, and you know it's got furniture, but has nothing else. We have to provide every fork, wine glass, knife, TV. It could be forty grand or fifty grand, but you'd have to buy that stuff anyway to set up the home to that standard. So now most homes already have forks and knives and all the basic things in place. 
So that's where that ten fifteen thousand dollar number and the bulk of that is linens. Linens we have we're very passionate about. We've tested dozens of linen companies. We have one a partner, global partnership with one. It's phenomenal. They last a long time. They handle the wear. They get amazing feedback consistently. And that's almost 50% to 70% of usually the, the initial budget that's just linens. But a great night's sleep can change someone's life and make them you know, highly desirable to want to come back to your home uh, time and time again. And then the rest of the things are just fillers to make sure that when someone goes and they want to have 10 people over Thanksgiving dinner, they know there's a turkey baster, a roasting pan, 14 wine glasses. They have all the things that they know. They're not guessing when they get down there. So those are all the fillers that we would add in through the audit. And, and we have a central warehouse in Colorado. We just check all the things off the audit list. We press a button. Two pallets show up to your house in the Smoky Mountains. We send a team down. We set it up, um, get it dialed in, and then it's ready for uh, the Luxus program. There well, let's go. just pretend that I'm a prospective client. How do are you? Uh, how are you going to find the cleaners in each of these markets and source these? You know, that's a big pr- pain in the rear end. <laughs> it is a big pain in the rear end. We've, you know, we've been dealing with it for 20 years almost, right? So we're used to it of ha- having this. So we always get a really interview and find a kick-ass person on the ground that becomes our boots on the ground. And that's our kind of local property manager. So we have the head office support and infrastructure for distribution and brand standard, but the local person is really the key component. And it's their responsibility to help find the handyman, you know, the cleaners. And we work with them to ultimately make sure we got the right team on the ground to execute. And so cleaners, for example, is really hard, but we're, we're a good established company. We, we pay well, we pay on time. Mm-hmm. And as a result, um, we've got a track record of ensuring we can, you know, recruit and retain great talent on the ground. And so it's never been a problem for us, not to say that it's easy because it's not easy every day, um, but you know, 20,000 vacations later in group number one, um, it's something we got a lot of confidence we can execute on. Yeah. You know, this is a question I get all the time and people come, come to me and they want to learn how to be, you know, property manager, et cetera. And, and they're nervous about hiring the cleaner, but it's what I'm going to say is it sounds like exactly what you're saying is it's just all about, uh, practice, you know, <laughs> hiring and firing is a skill. It's true. And if you've never done it before, it is extremely nerve wracking. And quite frankly, it never really gets easy, but you do get, <laughs> yeah. you do get better at it. Right. Can you give me some uh, reassuring information for people listening right now that it does get better when hiring cleaners? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we've, we've tried all sorts of things. So early stage, we would hire like a one person cleaner in Hawaii, for example, which is kind of hard market to find cleaners. And they were really inexpensive. They were like 200 bucks a clean. But, um, you know, and we thought it was great. They were really nice. They interviewed very well. And they do a really good job. But what we found personally, these small companies, our flip days are tight. Check out at 11, check in at 4. And so they're like, oh, I'm on holidays this week or I'm sick this day. And there's no backup. And there's no person in there to kind of step in their shoes. So we've actually gone to bigger, more established cleaning companies that have the backup and resort, and we just pay more for that, frankly. But the guest experience is so critical. If at 11 a.m. a checkout happens and that place is not clean by 4 p.m., you have a very disappointed client and a bad review coming up at 5 p.m. that same day. So what we've done is through the interview process, make sure A, you know, they got a good track record. B, they have backup. Even if they're a, a small shop, that's okay. But it's like, well, I'm not doing it. I have these three other people can step in my shoes. So, And then from there, just pay them well and pay them on time. Like that's what these guys are looking for. And it's uh, a lot of times we pay in advance to some of our local vendors. They were really small shops and they love that. No one does that. And so once you do that, there's plenty of amazing talented cleaning companies and cleaners out there, but they're used to kind of being jerked around, frankly. So be, be the, um, the client for them that pays them first, takes care of them. And you have a good system of expectations. So we have a cleaning standard purpose. It's exactly how we we make the beds and the whole thing. And it's at first they like it, they like it because they like they know exactly what your expectations are, and they just execute to that checklist. You know, our deep clean standards. We have a whole checklist once a month. They have to move the couches and move the pad of furniture and sweep out all the dust bunnies out. They like that. You know, it's uh, it works out really well to give them some certainty in the process, and they're going to stick with you. You know, unless you start jerking them around, you know, and so we just take care of good people. Not every cleaner has been with us since day one. We've obviously had turnover and you find new people, but there's lots of good people. They just want to be treated well. And I think a lot of uh, people in the industry aren't, frankly. So just just treat them well and they'll stick with you. Talk to me about Costa Rica. I think you you still right now have a property or two in Costa Rica. What What's that like? I'm fascinated with uh, other countries, et cetera. And that's that's one that comes up pretty often. 
Yeah, I'm a big fan of Costa Rica personally. I think it's uh, still been my favorite vacation spot uh, in the world because you get this really amazing, like, nurturing, high-quality people, this Latin America country. Um, and, uh, you know, you can fly into – we always focus in the northwest of Costa Rica. We had four properties at our peak. Obviously, those are during our ownership phase. We now have three properties in our program. Two are for rent right now, another one coming online in a couple months and for the rental side. And um, what I love about it is that the northwest part of Costa Rica in particular, you can fly into Liberia, which is a small like tourist airport versus going through San Jose, which can be a little scary and, and, and frankly, maybe a, frank, a little bit sketchy too, to get to the southern part. It's weather's perfect. The ocean's unbelievable. And everything is so reasonably priced. So like our clients would go there and feel like they live like kings because we can hire a chef three meals a day for like 500 bucks. And you got eight people in your house. You divide that out. That's cheaper than going to a restaurant. So that same person in Hawaii would cost $3,000 for a day of chefing or $2,000. So you get to live like kings. And the people down there are just wonderful, super wonderful. And so as a result of that, if you like ocean sports and tropical climate, I just think in Latin America – it's hard to be Costa Rica, uh, Northwest Costa Rica, but I'm sure the South is amazing as well. We haven't spent time down there. We're always in that Northwest part. Very easy to get in, in and out of Liberia airport. And it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's a, it is a great rental market and it's got a, a good uh, nine to 10 month season. So for property managers, you know, hyper seasonal pro destinations are hard to generate the revenue, but aside from September, October and the bit of August, it's a pretty consistent booking system from November through till middle of August. Um, and the flights and everything, air left out of there is great. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Costa Rica. We want to probably get to 20 properties there. Okay, wonderful. Um, you like to travel is, is really where all this came from, right? And uh, that's the name yeah. of the game. That's why we're here. We like to go places, see things. Uh, exactly, exactly. Exciting. We're passionate travelers. I'm with you, man. I love it. Very exciting. Okay, cool. Talk to me about, uh, let's say I'm a prospective property manager like yourself. How are you acquiring uh, new, new uh, clients? Yeah. So right now it's um, because we had such a strong following being in the business for 17, 18 years. We had a lot of affluent uh, uh, clients in our first program. Most of our initial business is coming from our initial network. And we're you know blessed that we've got, you know, a thousand people that have followed Luxus over the time. And they're all you know, high net worth families and they have homes. They want to acquire homes. So that's kind of our primary source of growth right now. And that'll probably get us our first 40 to 50 homes. And that's hard for someone that maybe doesn't have that network, but we've been at it for almost two decades. So we're fortunate to have that kickoff. From there, we're really going to be um, kind of two strategies, referral basis. So one homeowner tells another homeowner, be like, I'm getting doing great with these guys. These guys are phenomenal. And one thing carrot we have that others don't have, I didn't mention this, but it's important. We have a global exchange program. So a homeowner, whether they come through referral or in our group or however they're solicited, they come to us. Certainly, we want to property manage and revenue manage their house and deliver the best return possible. And they can, of course, use their homes as much as they want. Um, we also have this exchange program. So if you had a house in the Maui and you want to exchange that home to go to Tuscany, we have a system in which you can exchange your homes within the people in our portfolio that have opted into that program, which almost everyone's opting in. So that's very unique. I mean, there are exchange programs like Third Home and such out there. But to our, to our knowledge, we're the only property management company that actually does home exchange. Um, so we take care. So when you exchange your home from Maori for the Smoky Mountains, you know what you're going to get no matter what on either side. So it's a really nice carrot uh, for uh, property owners to basically um, uh, you know, convert them to the Luxus program. But to get them in the door, we use our network. And then the second thing we do is we have a referral program for realtors. Realtors are a massive conduit to short-term people that are short-term renting their homes. So we go to realtors, we have a, a little referral program for them. They refer someone to us. We work hard to earn their business. If we do earn their business and they come in the Luxus program, we pay a little upfront fee and then we pay a little percentage of rent of the first year to that realtor. And the realtor, realtors, I mean, they want the money, but they want to make sure their clients are looked after. That's the number one piece. And we want to have a track record of showing that our clients are, are looked after. So when they refer someone, they just sold the house in whatever, Santa Monica to, they feel confident they can refer them to Luxus that that client's going to be well looked after from all facets. And so the realtor network is going to be a very big channel for us on our growth, you know, aspirations over the coming years. All right. Great. Great. Well, wonderful. How do we find you? Uh, so uh, www.luxus, so L-U-X-U-S, VP, vacationproperties.com. Go check it out. And um, if you're a guest, uh, you can 
Coupon, sign up to the loyalty program. Again, there's no cost, and we'll just keep we'll just keep you up to date as property launches. If you're a homeowner, same thing. There's a link on there, and you got a home that you think it could be a fit for the Luxus portfolio. Um, send us the information. Not every home is going to be a fit for us because uh, we want to make sure we're a fit for you. But if you're you know curious about the homeowner aspect, we'd love to have a chance to look at your property and see if it's a fit and uh, talk about a partnership. And on Instagram, uh, Luxus VP. So that would be the places to find us. All right, brother. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on uh, Short Term Rental Management. And uh, don't be a stranger. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Look forward to working with you, Luke. Great times, man. Thank you. All right, later.